I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. Episode 5, Season 4 of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Redcon 1, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast. I'm your host, John Hansen, and in this season of the Bodybuilding Legends Podcast, we of course are talking about the 1990 Mr. Olympia, which was the only drug-tested Mr. Olympia ever. And our guest this week is the always controversial but always honest Mike Quinn. And Mike was one of the top bodybuilders in the 1980s. He won the 1987 MPC, Mr. USA. And he was also a 1984 NABA Mr. Universe winner. And Mike was one of the most popular pro bodybuilders in the 1980s, not only for his physique, but also his attitude on stage. And he was very popular in the magazines because he always spoke his mind. And that's what he's going to do with us today. He's going to speak his mind. So, of course, Mike's views are his own. I don't necessarily agree with everything he says. I agree with some of the things he says, but Mike will say whatever is on his mind. So it's going to be a very interesting and open interview where Mike will talk about the state of bodybuilding today, as well as his views on the 1990 Mr. Olympia and many other subjects. All right. As I mentioned, we are brought to you by Redcon 1. At Redcon 1, everyone wants to be a champion and everyone wants to be the best. Redcon 1 believes in working hard to achieve your goals. Whether you're killing it in the gym or running a six-minute mile, Redcon 1 has something for those willing to put in the work. Their premier clinically dosed pre-workout, Total War, is the perfect companion to your workout to give you that extra push to break through your mental and physical barriers. And then after your workout, you can fuel your body with the revolutionary MRE. It is the only whole food complete meal replacement with protein coming from salmon, chicken, beef, and eggs, and the carbs from sweet potatoes and oats, and it also contains 10 grams of fat from MCT oil. It is the best-tasting complete meal you will ever have. So go to redcon1.com and try the very best that sports nutrition has to offer. Redcon 1, the highest state of readiness. And for the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, you can enter the discount code LEGENDS and get a full 15% discount off your order. Thank you to Aaron Singerman and Redcon One for sponsoring the Bodybuilding Legends podcast again. We're also brought to you by Old School Labs. Now, I've been with Old School Labs for several years now. This is a supplement company that draws on the wisdom of the golden age of bodybuilding to offer unique supplements to the discerning athlete. Old School Labs is the only brand that I use, trust, and associate my name with. And they are the brand that I used to win the Masters Natural Mr. Universe in 2012, as well as all the photo shoots I've done and every time I have to get in shape. It's also the company that sponsors Breon Ansley, who was the new 2017 Classic Physique Olympia champion. And they promote also Sergio Oliva Jr., who is getting ready for the Arnold Classic. So you can use the discount code LEGENDS12 to receive 12% off your order Old School Labs supplements that make sense. And I had a meeting with Old School Labs this week, and I've got some news that they are coming out with a new protein powder pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. All right, in other news, we did two really great interviews this last week to finish off our uh, 1990 Mr. Olympia series, which is season four of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I talked to Mike Christian earlier in the week, and I asked Mike about what he thought about his accusations that he was using that drug to fend at the 1990 Mr. Olympia, and I even played the tape for him of uh, Rich Gaspar mentioning that. So we'll have Mike's interview coming up in a couple of weeks. And I was also very happy to talk to Peter McGuff, who's my friend. He's living out here in Florida. Peter was one of the best writers ever in the bodybuilding and fitness industry. And so we had a really long conversation with Peter about not only the 1990 Mr. Olympia, which he had a lot of thoughts on, as I mentioned before, Peter wrote a 10,000 word article about the 1990 Mr. Olympia. But we also talked about the state of bodybuilding today, and we talked about some of the good old days with the NABA Universe competitions, and also Peter's career, how he got started publishing his own magazine out in England, and then how he was uh, recruited by Joe Weider to come to California and work for Joe Weider. So that was really, really good stuff. Great conversation. So next week, we're going to be talking to Eddie Robinson, and then after that, we'll be talking to Mike Christian and Peter McGuff. So we got a really great series here at the Bodybuilding Legends podcast for season four 
the 1990 Mr. Olympia discussion. I also had a chance to do a really fun interview with Scott McNally and BJ Puri on their Advices radio show. And of course, Scott and BJ are the hosts of Bodybuilding Nerds Radio, which I've mentioned on the show before. And they review my show as well as all the other bodybuilding podcasts. They review that each week on their Bodybuilding Nerds podcast. But they have a other show called Bodybuilding Advices Radio, which my mistake, I was calling it Bodybuilding Advice Radio, and they sort of castigated me for that. So uh, it's actually Advices Radio, like, of course, in the movie Pumping Iron. So it's not that hard for me to give him the wrong advices. So that's what Advices Radio is. It's the wrong advices. I get it. Sorry, Sorry guys. I missed that meaning when we started the show. That was a really, really fun interview. So go to Advices Radio and check that out. It's episode number 50 with Scott McMally and BJ Curry. And uh, it was really, really a lot of fun. Thanks to those guys for uh, having me on the show. And as I mentioned, the book, Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends, volume one is selling really well on amazon.com. So if you haven't got it, please go to amazon.com and buy your copy. And I will have a few copies that I will be autographing and mailing out. So if you're interested in that, then email me at naturalolympia at gmail.com and I will see if I can get you one, but I've only got limited amounts of copies. So email me that as, as soon as you can. I've also got another book out. It's called The MP6 Workout. And uh, this book is a training book and it's about a new workout system that I devised a couple of years ago. It's called The MP6 Workout. MP stands for Mass and Power. And the six stands for six-week training cycles. So basically, it's almost like what the powerlifters use. It's a periodization system. And you first spend six weeks developing your power, where you're getting stronger. And then using that same workout with the same exercises, you can change it around, use higher reps for more mass, more mass building system, where you're doing like six to 10 reps. And then you can build more mass because you are stronger now from the power system. So I've been using it as I mentioned, for the last couple of years, and it's really, really a great system for advanced trainers who want to find a cycling system, periodization system, where you can increase both mass and power. So I put this all together in a book. It's called the MP6 Workout, and that also is available on Amazon.com. So if you're looking for something to change your training around, or if you know someone that's into training and may appreciate this, we got the holidays coming up, go to uh, Amazon.com and look up the MP6 Workout as well as the Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends, Volume 1. Mentioning that, I have to mention uh, my friend Tony Bimonte, who just did his first show about a week ago. I started helping Tony at the gym with his diet and with his training, and he was up to 260 pounds. Tony's a big Italian guy, likes to eat, of course, and he's been working out for the last couple of years, but he never took his diet seriously. And then he's uh, watched a couple other people from the gym uh, compete, so he decided he wanted to compete. He had a scare with cancer a few years ago, so he wanted to do everything natural. So he contacted me, and I set him up on a diet. And I got to tell you, Tony is one of the most successful clients I've ever had. He was so dedicated. This guy's got an incredible work ethic. He stuck to the diet. He stuck to the training, and he lost so much weight so fast. He got in incredible shape. This is the best he's ever looked, he told me, in his adult lifetime. He's in his 40s, but this is the best he's ever looked ever since he got out of high school. So he was so psyched up about it, and he wanted to compete in his first show. So he did uh, Paul Revelia's show a couple of weeks ago out here in Tampa, Florida, at the University of South Florida. Tony went in the men's physique competition and the Masters and the Novice. He did really well, but it was just really a celebration of the great progress that he's made. And I think he was down to uh, 212 pounds from a beginning weight of 260. He lost over six inches on his waist, which was amazing. So if you're friends with me on Facebook, check out his pictures. I got his pictures plastered all over there because, as I said, Tony was one of the most amazing clients I've ever worked with, and I really made some incredible progress. So now he's psyched up. He did his first show. He wasn't quite in contest shape as some of these other guys were who were more experienced, but it was like as I said, it was a celebration of the amazing progress he made, and now he is all psyched up for 2018. We are going to change Tony's diet around and put him up more on a a mass gaining cycle. So he's going to start gaining some size. I'm going to change his training routine around and his diet. And then we'll get him lean again and get him more ripped for a contest next year in 2018. And I've been helping a lot of other guys from the gym as well as a lot of people online. So if anybody is interested in uh, changing your dad bod to a rip bod, 
email me at naturalolympia at gmail.com and we will set you up with a questionnaire and get you going so you can get in shape before the new year. A lot of these guys are making amazing progress. It's amazing what the bodybuilding lifestyle can do. Just training with weights, following cardio, and then just adhering to a great diet. And I take care of all the details with that. I figure out the protein, carbs, and fats. I do everything by the numbers. And uh, it's working for everybody that I'm helping right now. So if you guys want to get on the success train and start making some progress, then send me an email at naturalolympia at gmail.com. All right, over at the bodybuildinglegendshow.com website, we got the new Mike Ashley interview up, part two. So we had part one up last month, and now we have part two, and it's got some great video clips in there from when Mike was competing in the Niagara Falls Grand Prix back in 1988, the one that Phil Hill won, and also a really great tape or video clip in there from when Mike competed in the 1990 Pro Ironman Invitational, which was actually the very first Pro Ironman Invitational in California. And I was actually at that show. I was visiting California at the time and I got to see the very first Ironman and Mike took second to Sean Ray. So I've got both of their posing routines on this video. So you really want to check that out. Some amazing physiques back during that era. And Mike has a great interview with me about competing and winning his first pro show back in 1987 and doing his first Olympia that year. And then uh, the strategies he used with his training and diet to increase his muscle mass to come back in 1990 better than ever and win the very first drug-tested Arnold Classic. And, of course, we're talking about the drug-tested Mr. Olympia that year. And Mike was unfortunately not able to do that contest because he had uh, knee issues, knee problems. He had, I think, seven surgeries done on both knees over the course of his career. So he had a lot of knee problems plaguing his career. And Unfortunately, he wasn't able to do that, Mr. Olympia. We talk about a lot of subjects in this interview about how the physiques have changed to today and the posing routines and all about his training and diet programs, you know, that helped him become one of the best drug-free bodybuilders ever. Probably the only drug-free bodybuilder that was able to compete at the very top of the IFBB. So it's a great interview. Oh, and I also saw on Facebook this week uh, from Dan Solomon that the movie Bigger has now wrapped up. That's the Joe Weider biopic that they were filming in Birmingham, Alabama. And as I mentioned on the show a couple weeks ago, I was out there in Birmingham to check out the filming of that. So now they are completely finished with it. It looks like they did some beach scenes, probably when Joe Weider was doing photo shoots. I know uh, Men's Physique Pro uh, Steve Cook was in some of those. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a great movie, and I really can't wait to see it. It's probably going to be a year before it comes out. But uh, this is a great thing for bodybuilding to have Joe Weider's story on the big screen. And this is going to be a real movie. It's not going to be one that just goes right to Netflix or uh, DVD. This is actually going to be in the movie. So I think everybody in the bodybuilding world is really excited about that. So congratulations to Dan Solomon. He said he would uh, come on our show in a couple of weeks so I could interview him about it. So we will definitely have Dan on probably after this uh, 1990 Mr. Olympia series is over with. I also want to mention we are brought to you by Florida Alternative Medicine, where age is just a number. If you want to feel great, optimize your energy levels, burn fat, and balance your hormone levels to maximize your potential, then go see the experts at Florida Alternative Medicine and Weight Loss. They have a certified and knowledgeable staff that will work with you to achieve your goals and get you the results you've been looking for. They offer a wide range of services that ensure you will not only look and feel amazing, but also be comfortable knowing they're there for you every step of the way. They also have very competitive pricing along with their quality products and services. So that's just a few reasons to give them a try. So you can call them at 813-922-8939 or email them at info at flalternativemeds.com. Again, that number is 813-922-8939 or email them at info at flalternativemeds.com. All right, I want to thank all of our sponsors, Redcon One, Old School Labs, and Florida Alternative Medicine for sponsoring this episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And here's our interview with the always controversial but always entertaining Mike Quinn. Here you go. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. And we have a very special guest this week, Mighty Mike Quinn, one of my idols growing up in the bodybuilding scene. And we're going to talk about the uh, 1990 Mr. Olympia as well as other things. Hey, Big Mike, how you doing? Hey, what's happening, brother? Thank you for having me on. All right. Thanks for joining us again. Let me ask you. I really want to talk about that fiasco. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my God. I figured we'll we'll talk about that show because that was kind of a unique show, right? The only one that was drug tested. 
Yeah, and uh, don't for, you guys don't seem to remember, 27 guys entered and 14 mm-hmm. guys failed the test that they thought they could beat. Yeah, you know? 14 so, guys failed, right. Barry DeMay failed. I mean, he's, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Who are some of the other ones? Vinny Comerford, right? J.J. Marsh? Yeah. A lot of top guys. And, you know, obviously the way I looked, I took nothing. Right. You know? I mean, you should have dropped me off at the Olympic pool somewhere because I, I look like a swimmer. <laughs> you know? I had to do so much cardio, my legs just disappeared. Yeah. I had a great posing routine, so that's all I care about. You did. I remember I was there. Hey, Mike, first of all, let me ask you, uh, how are you feeling? Because I know you've, you've gone through a lot of surgeries. I know your fans are out there, is, you know, want to know how you're doing. You know, I just had my gallbladder out, had on my arm surgery last year. They just released me to train like three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I ruptured my ul- ulnar nerve and, and smashed my carpal bone into a bunch of pieces. Wow. It was a long, long recovery. And mm-hmm. then, um, of course, um, I get released. And then uh, two weeks before I get released, I got this massive pain in my stomach. And uh, sure enough, I needed my gallbladder removed. And I had that done, stayed infected for about five weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the anti- I was on antibiotics the whole time. So, you know, that's destroyed my system. Yeah. It is what it is. I'm banged up, and now I'm just waiting for a hip injection. Mm-hmm. And I'm supposed to have neck surgery, but I'm not having any more surgeries. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, it seems like everything just gets worse after the surgery, well, right? Yeah, I need to get in shape, finish my book, and travel. You know? Yeah, somebody, uh, when I posted on Facebook earlier today that I was going to be talking to you, somebody said, ask Mike about the book. So what's going on with the book? I, I can't do anything unless I'm healthy. Mm-hmm. And I just, I mean, it's about 200 pages are done, but I okay. just have to do obviously the most recent stuff, you know, and I'm glad, I'm glad it took this long because of the controversy going on. Honestly, the drugs have just ruined this sport. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. These, guys look, these guys look like shit. I mean, I've never <laughs> seen people look worse than what we're looking at now. Mm-hmm. The guy who won never should have won in a million years. Kind of like the same shit, but a different era. Yeah. You know? I've seen people deserve to win and not win. Mm-hmm. My whole life, and it's not going to change. But this year, I'm sorry. And I can't believe I just heard CBS picked it up. Why would CBS show that drug-infested show? <laughs> I don't understand that. You know, classical physique and fitness, I understand, because that's yeah. taking over. Right, classical right. Physique should be, classical physique should be taking over, and pro bodybuilding should be on its way out. Yeah, it looks like classical physique is going gonna, is gonna to really move well, up. My, it seems like everybody's excited about it. Oh, I've just seen the guy who won, man. He looked amazing. Yeah, Brian Ansley, yeah. He looked identical to my era. He yeah. had a lot of muscle mass, too. But, you know, he mm-hmm. had the frozen trunks. They were making one of those little shorts. But still, but still, the guy was phenomenal. I was very impressed yeah. with him. And obviously, they're not abusing the drugs. I mean, that kid never took any insulin. I can tell by looking at his body. Mm-hmm. You know, the guys that are constantly taking insulin and I've never seen more bodybuilders die in my whole life. Yeah. You know, who yeah, died we... in my era? I mean, two people. Mm-hmm. You know, that was it. And one was Momo Beneziza, because he was so dehydrated after he won the show in Holland. When the paramedics came, nobody spoke Dutch, so he died. All yeah. he needed was a shot of adrenaline and IV bags. But, you know, Porter Control was there and watched him die. Right. You know, and nobody, you know, I don't know where Barry DeMay or any Dutch people were, but nobody was there to converse with the paramedics, and he died. You weren't there at that show, right, Mike? No, hell no. I would have ran down the lobby and grabbed somebody, you know, spoke Dutch and English, because English is pretty well spoken in, in Holland. Mm-hmm. I've lived there many, many times with Barry DeMay. Yeah. Once at a time. And uh, I love Holland. But, and then you had Andreas Monza. Mm-hmm. Bleeding out his rectum and did not go to the hospital. Competed the following week, still didn't go to the hospital. Competed a week later in the German Grand Prix, so now he's been basically you know, shitting blood for about 15 days. Mm-hmm. And by the time they got him on the operating table and they opened him up, he was flooded with blood. They couldn't save right. him. And his whole cavity was just full of blood and they could not save him. So that's the only two deaths I know of, just based on a couple of mistakes. But not, you know, come on, last year, what we had a. Iranian bodybuilder died last year, 34 years old, had a massive heart attack. How does that happen to somebody 34 years old? Yeah. You know, you got to think about these things. And bodybuilders mm-hmm. are dying all over the world. Yeah. And uh, come on, my whole era, everybody's alive. 
I mean, that that just shows a point that we never abuse stuff. You know, we never stayed on drugs year round, bro. I couldn't. Yeah. It made me crazy. It made me crazy. <laughs> I didn't want to go to jail, you know. Right. But I was diagnosed with ADHD, and I was obviously bipolar. Um, yeah, we talked. You know, we talked about this many times about yeah. how hard the guys trained back then, and you know, back in the eighties. And uh, I just saw an interview yeah, yesterday honestly, with. Uh, I even seen Phil Heath train. He could never have trained with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I watched a video on training. Yeah, sure, heavy, but you know, it takes his time between sets, and he's not even yeah. huffing and puffing. When I right. trained, man, I, I could barely make it through a workout without getting nauseous, especially mm-hmm. legs and back. We trained fast and hard. That's how you right. get in shape. You know, these guys are not even close. Yeah. I mean, it's a shame, you know, because what they're doing is, you know, steroid addiction with teenagers is through the roof. Mm-hmm. Because they're following these idiots. I yeah, mean, don't you think that you know with social media now, it's like uh, it's almost like it's okay to take drugs. I just thought, I just interviewed uh, Mike Ashley and uh, a couple Mike's weeks never ago. Never taking drugs, right? And he w- he was talking about how I asked him about the drugs back then, and I said, "Why did you never take them?" And he said, "Well, you know, back then they were there was like a lot of talks about how dangerous the drugs were," and he goes, "I was afraid to take them." And he goes, now it's the opposite. He goes, now people are talking about them and they're bragging about how much you're taking and it seems like it's okay to take them. Well, it's not okay. If you're doing hormone replacement therapy like myself, I get 200 megs a week. That's mm-hmm. okay because it brings me back to normal. Right. But, you know, you've got these young kids, you know, teenagers, taking 500 milligrams of tests a week along with now they're getting into the synthol shit. And yeah. May, Rich Pian and rest in peace, I liked him. But he did not do anything good for these kids. Mm-hmm. You know, they followed him like a god. And, mm-hmm. you know, he wasn't a pro. I mean, his body was just blown up chemically. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it didn't help. I, right. I texted him once. I said, Rich, why don't you just do a post telling kids you shouldn't take steroids until your natural growth, which is about 19. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the first time ever to the cycle, but I went on shows. I only did drugs right before a show. Right. You know, like I said, they made me crazy. And I was so naturally strong, mm-hmm. I didn't need them. Oh, yeah. God, I benched 440 in high school. No drugs. Yeah, I remember seeing a picture of you, Mike, at the, well, I think the first pictures I saw of you were right before the 81 Teenage America that you won. And I was yeah. like, holy shit, who's this guy? Look at the arms on this guy, you know? Yeah, well, you know, I got that from training hard. My mm-hmm. father literally beat me in the gym. Yeah. I mean, I would be done with my last set of an exercise. He'd already be done with the next set of an exercise. Mm-hmm. And he would make me go from that to the next exercise. Dude, talk about migraines and nausea. You, you wouldn't <laughs> believe it. And I yeah. trained with heavy weight. Right. Heavy poundages. Right. You know, so it's, um, I don't know, I watch all these guys training on videos that I have on, and they're just pumping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. Plus, look at them. They're so big. And they, they can't train hard. They can't even breathe. Mm-hmm. Who did I just watch guest polls? Somebody just last year guest polls and they had to get more oxygen right after they got off the stage. Mm-hmm. And then Dallas got sick. And, you know, come on. They're trying to say he choked on food. Listen, I don't believe in a million years that's how he died. Mm-hmm. Okay. When you have a heart attack, your throat closes. Okay, a doctor has already came on and said this guy had a heart attack. Okay, mm. because his stroke closed. It looked like he was gagging, but he was already in the middle of a heart attack. Maybe they would have saved him if paramedics sat there in time and, you know, got the food out of his mouth and opened up his airways. But, you know, come on. This is mm-hmm. what we're looking at. Come on, what, 330 pounds? I mean, you can, he was just, I mean, big and huge. I'm sorry. Big is not better. Yeah. You guys lack those real deep cuts. Separation. I mean, look at all these guys compete. They have faces. You know, I mean, yeah. we were like Stel. We were like right, Stel or right, Stelator right. in our era. Mm-hmm. If I, my face wasn't sunk in, I wasn't ready. What year do you, you think know? it all changed, Mike? What, when do you think it started to make a turn? Um, uh, it changed for the worst. Uh, it was probably right up to when Ronnie finally won the Olympia and his stomach was bloated. Okay. Remember last year. You remember last year? I mean, Maybe like 2000, 2001? Yeah, I forget the year, but he was phenomenal. He brought to the next level. I didn't think anybody's ever going to be better than him, and nobody ever will be better than him. Right. And as far as conditioning, size, and separation, we'll, we'll never see that again in our lifetime. That mm-hmm. is for sure. 
Yeah. You know, uh, Dor- Dorian never hurt the sport. Mm-hmm. No. Lee Haney never hurt the sport. These yeah. guys were great. You know, these guys were great, you know, Mr. Olympias, mm-hmm. in my opinion. And uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Heath is the worst Mr. Olympia ever as yeah. far as promoting our sport. I seen mm-hmm. him four years ago turn down autographs to kids mm-hmm. at the Arnold Classic, and I was disgusted. I mean, yeah. my God, you have the honor of these people asking for your autograph. You stop what you're doing, do the autograph, and take a picture. I don't give a fuck where you are. Mm-hmm. You know, you're okay. supposed to do that. Why do you think the sport is? That's why fitness is exploding. I mean, mm-hmm. why do you think it becomes less and less interesting? Even though on social media, they're saying it's getting greater and greater. Who are they talking about? Yeah. You know, it's not getting any better. Do you see it getting any better? I see it getting worse. Right. And you have a Mr. Olympia win with a bloated GH belly, then you've got to know that stuff is really wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they need to readjust. Now I'm seeing the IFBB and NPC is split. I mean, there's just so much bullshit going on. I don't even know mm-hmm. why that's happening. Do you? Do you know why they separated? No. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I just know another thing going on. Right. But, but you know... They're pushing Look. classic physique, suit, and it's going to take over. Number one reason, Arnold's behind it. You know, yeah. Arnold's, disgust, Arnold's disgusted with Mr. Olympia. Yeah. It feels like a shame he ever was one because of what they've done to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. The two guys that should have won was, um, what's his name? Dexter and Barnack should have won. I mm-hmm. don't care. Come on, look at the condition they were in. And they're right. getting beat by some bolted pig. <laughs> this is why, you know, think about what it does to other competitors. Okay, mm-hmm. They come in their best condition. You know, you got guys even in better shape, a few places down the line that are better. Okay, so you're going to get ready for next year, but why? I mean, Big Ramy's never going to win. They're not going to let somebody win that doesn't speak really good English. I mean, he speaks mm-hmm. broken English, but that's not going to happen. When did you see the last Mr. Olympia that couldn't speak English? Yeah. I mean, really? It could be a proper spokesperson in the United States. Right. I've never seen that. And, you know, Rolly Winkler, same thing. I mean, these guys peaked a week later. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, Big, Big Remy was good, but, you know, I don't care. He's still out of proportion. Mm-hmm. You know, he, I don't understand how his calves are that small when his thighs are that big. You, you know, think this was the best he looked this year? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But being the best for him is... Obviously, he was bigger and higher than Phil Heath. If he can't win looking like that, he's never going to win. Mm-hmm. I mean, make it, I predict this and watch next year. Okay, what's going to happen now? Phil's going to be smart enough to deal with his GH belly this year, and he's going to come in shop and win again. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the writing's on the wall. They're going to keep him there. As a, I don't know why they like him so much because you know, he's a shit example of what a Mr. Olympia should be mm-hmm. as far as you know, fans, everything, interviews. And, oh, my God, if I was in that fucking show, when he talked at people and pointed fingers, like, I've already won, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Why didn't somebody get up and fucking crack him? I would have. <laughs> I, I, I know you would have. I would have got up and said, listen, motherfucker, you're not, who are you talking to? <laughs> you know, I've never seen anybody do that, predict he should win and then look like shit. Mm-hmm. You know what? And I'll say this to his, this punk's face. You know, he thinks he's some kind of tough guy, you know? Pull up that little video of him backing down from a 200-pound boxer named Prophet. You know, he backed down like that? a fucking cowick. It's online. Oh, really? I approached him before he was going into the gym to train. Mm-hmm. And I uh, basically said, you know, I can whip your ass. As soon as that guy would have said that to me, I would have butted him in the face. <laughs> I would have smashed my forehead into his nose. Mm-hmm. I don't like to hurt my hands when I used to fight. And Rich Piana backed down from the same kid. I mean, my God, yeah, it's, yeah. it's out there, dude. Look for it. You know, it's out there. I mean, watching it just made me sick. What about you know, Cedric? Like, Cedric McMillan? You think he could beat Phil? Well, he was off this year, you know? Yeah, he was way off this year, yeah. Come on, he should beat um, all these All these guys that come in top, con- top condition, you know, Barnack, Dexter, Roden, and him. You know, those guys could be Mr. Olympia, but like I said, they're not going to let him win. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to kill it. It's the Mr. It's, now it's uh, Phil Heath, Mr. Olympia. I yeah. guarantee you, watch what happens next year. I'm never yeah. wrong with this shit. 
I've yeah. dealt with the politics. I've watched what's going on in our history. Right. Hey, come on. I, I don't support something. They go, one Mr. Olympia in 1980 and look like shit. Mm-hmm. And then in 1981, Franco Colombo won with one leg. Mm-hmm. How do you win with one leg? Right. Doesn't that tell you what the history is about? We're just yeah. we living it more in a contemporary fashion. I mean, it is just, it's just the same, to be honest with you. When you did your first Olympia in 88, I remember that. That was one of my favorite Mr. Olympias to watch because it seemed oh, like a lot of the guys yeah. went, in, went in for condition, right? They didn't try to outsize the, Haney. And, the, there were so yeah, many great guys the, in that show. I thought that was the best Mr. Olympia in the history of Bartonville. Yeah, I, I do too. Without a doubt. I got royally bent over and fucked. Mm-hmm. I mean, how does Gary Stratton beat me with no back and can't pose to save his life? Yeah. I mean, I got a standing ovation when I did my pose routine. Yeah. I mean, I'm standing on stage after, and I'm looking down, and Arnold's standing up clapping for me. Right. And I was the right. only one that got that kind of ovation in the show. That was, your first, that was your first Olympia, right, Mike? Yeah. They put me six because they put in past magazines before that. that I would never break top ten. I was like, really? Well, mm-hmm. I'm bringing the pack because they won't believe. And I went down to 204. And uh, came back to the night show about 2.09, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, come on, you don't see one mandatory of me against Richie, Lee Labrada, or Barry DeMay from that Mr. Olympia. Hmm. You see me being compared to Stridham and all the other guys placed behind, you know, later placed mm-hmm. behind us. Look, you don't see one picture of me, especially turned around. Come on. Barry DeMay, Lee Labrada, Rich Gasperi couldn't turn around against me. I don't care. I'm not arrogant. One picture says a thousand words. And I had the only back in that show that could go toe-to-toe with Lee Haney. Yeah. And the only, the only other guy that, if he had came in shredded, could have uh, done serious damage was that Brado Kowak. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing, yeah. amazing physique. But, you know, he came in off. Mm-hmm. And you've seen Sean Ray come in off. Mm-hmm. You know, he tried to compete at 205, and he should have competed at 195. Right. That was a mistake for him, but he came back. And shined. I yeah. mean, you were that asshole, Phil Hill. I wanted to punch. I ended up did smacking him during a Grand Prix tour. But what a asshole! Remember, he jumped out on stage. Yeah, what happened with that fight? What, what year was that? Was that like '89 or something? Um, it was the end of the tour. I think yeah, in '89. The show was over. We just did our last Grand Prix, and um, I'm tying my shoes in a locker room, with a room that's his rooms. You know, I go across the hall to the room where Ron Love. And him and a couple of other guys are changing. Right. So, you know, I got my pants on and, you know, I'm looking down and I look up and all I see is Phil Hill suck a wrong, suck a wrong love in the face while he was sitting down. Oh, my really? God. Oh, I went, there was a camera crew in front of us mm-hmm. right in the hallway trying to take footage. I win them over. I mean, <laughs> broke all the camera equipment, everything. And mm-hmm. when I got to him, I was surprised how weak he was. I picked him up like he weighed nothing because my adrenaline was flowing. I was so angry. Mm-hmm. And I picked him up and I slammed him on the back of a bench on his back. I'm just mm-hmm. getting ready to take him out. And sure enough, Ron gets up and tries to get him but throws a forearm and, you know, doesn't connect with Phil because he hits me in the back of the head, mm-hmm. on the neck of my base of my neck, and he gave me such severe whiplash, you know. I mean, I <laughs> suffered. I was like getting in a car accident. Yeah. Ron's a... Ron's a black belt in karate and a police officer and a nicest mm-hmm. guy, but I would, you know, I don't underestimate Ron. I mean, Ron would have wrecked him. That's why he sucker punched him. He wouldn't know what it was all over. Ron only asked what time the bus was leaving. And so what, why did uh, Phil Hill do that? What was the, what was the cost of that? Just, Ron just asked Phil, what time is the bus leaving? Oh, okay. And he cracked wow. him in the face. So, Crazy. Yeah, Phil, you know, Phil was a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. Um, he wouldn't even sit and eat with us. You know, all the athletes sat and ate, ate together for breakfast, right. lunch, you know, while we're prepping for the show. You know, you'd, you'd do one show, and that night you'd fly to the next ex, uh, next show. I did nine mm-hmm. Grand Prix after Mr. Olympia. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you had to repeat every week, and it, it was hard. Hardest yeah. thing I've ever done. I mean, but, you know, I, me and Brian Buchanan went fourth and fifth out of both Grand Prix circuits in 88 and 89. Mm-hmm. And we both smoked Labrador and Richie and Barry. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were just so much bigger, better backs. I mean, V tape up. Come on, Brian Buchanan was amazing. Oh, yeah, but, he was. You know, what you do, and we're sitting back and watching the politics. And, you know, there's a picture of me doing a side chest against Lee Labrador. And uh, I wreck him. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no, even my hamstrings, my legs, the sides of my upper body, I wreck him. And he mm-hmm. won the show. Right. So I always go by pictures and what I see. I don't fool myself. I'll be mm-hmm. the first one to tell you, when I'm off, I'm off. Yeah. You know, I've been off many, many times in my career. And every time they set up as it has been, I came back with a fury. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. the wrong person to tell, say I can't do something. Yeah. <laughs> All, it, all they don't realize is they fire them. It still fuels my fire. Yeah. And I've been doing Yeah, you did come back life. that year in, in 88 because we got fifth, oh, yeah. I think, at the Arnold. And, uh, at, uh, no, it wasn't the Arnold. It was the Pro World. It was before Pro the Arnold. World. But he, Pro World. Yeah. I took fourth. Robbie took third. Of right. You know, Robbie was my training partner then. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine my, I get the train with my auto going up? Right. But Amazing. But making him better than me, the LA Grand Prix and the Pro World, you know, yeah. Robbie was one place ahead of me, and my girlfriend at the time, Dana Golden, well, she was my fiance, she says, Mike, you got to stop training with Robbie. You're making him better than you. Mm-hmm. You know, and I did. I killed him. I mean, I made him train like me, and uh, I'm surprised he didn't have a heart attack. But <laughs> he stayed right neck and neck with me, and uh, but for, you know, the Olympia, I stopped training with him, and Robbie was like 15th, you know? Yeah, and he, he wasn't was. in the condition he was while training with me. Mm-hmm. So my training has something to do with getting in top condition. Yeah. So it, it does. It's not just a diet. And it, let's face it, everybody takes drugs. But, you know, if everybody took drugs, why ain't there a thousand Mike Quinn's out there? Mm-hmm. Why ain't there a thousand Lee Haney's, a thousand Dorian Hicks? You know what I'm saying? Right, just to right. Name a few. We don't see this. I mean, the drugs work, but if you don't have the balls... The mm-hmm. discipline to go hungry, bro. Oh, I had to stop. I, I was a force feeding like these idiots. None of us took insulin. Yeah. I mean, these guys are, you know, you have to fucking eat carbohydrates when you take insulin. Right. Who wants right. to do that? I mean, uh, you, you see these guys when they first start competing that they got real clean muscle separation. You see mm-hmm. the shows they turn pro. And then you look at them year to year and you can tell the ones that are taking insulin. Because mm-hmm. what happens with insulin growth is the muscle separation, it starts to fill in. Yeah. Okay, you, you see less and less of it. I mean, right. well, like I said, the only two guys that were mean shredded were Dexter and Bonac. Mm-hmm. Um, is that why we're seeing got, the guys from the 80s and 90s were so much more shredded than the guys are today? Yeah, because we had more, much more discipline. Mm-hmm. Didn't stay on drugs year-round. Fuck, yes, Lee Haney. He never took drugs all year until like three months before the Mission Olympia. Right. You know, all of us didn't take drugs year round. I know one guy that did, but I'm not going to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But then you had Stridham, who's been taking drugs since he's probably three years old, you know? <laughs> I mean, he's fucking, he's just all drugs. Really? Yeah. Every shit, how he thinks he's a legend in his own mind. He actually said he was going to be my ass. I can't wait to see him. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly can't wait because I'm going to tell him, Gary, take your best shot. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to fucking rip your head off. Yeah, <laughs> they just. So tough behind a computer screen, you know? Right. And know what they know? A lot of these people, when they attack me, they don't realize I know people all over the world. Mm-hmm. Let me give you an example. This one guy from England, you know, called my girl an ugly fat fuck. Okay, but my girl had nothing to do with what was in the post. So I get a hold of my friend David Grossland, who's over in England, and this guy's a monster. He has all these tapes on training. And if you ever pull them up, you'll see what I'm talking about. I mean, a real hardcore monster. So, you know, first off, the kid gets uh, David Grossman to call and threaten me. And then when I told him the story about why I was upset with him, he drove two hours and then choked the kid out. Oh, really? He drove two hours to find him and then choke him out. Hmm. So, you know, listen, talk shit about me all you want, but... I've helped so many people and done so much that, you know, I don't have a problem getting back up when somebody's trying to come after me. Mm-hmm. Never have. And I'm the same. I mean, you know, I've had people, look for people here down in Florida have done something and I found them. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, of course, I took care of business, but it's the right thing to do. Right. This, this, this sport is not a stand-up sport. You know, when guys mm-hmm. come back up, the shit that comes out of their mouths, yeah. especially Heath. Oh, my God. Uh, Olympia, he's just made me sick. Right. Tough guy. What a tough guy. Point of guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> I couldn't imagine what I would have done. <laughs> but you would never see Lee Haney doing that. No, humble, no, humble no, guy. No. You know, right. Or Dorian. Believes, 
you know the only reason why I couldn't be Ali Haney? I always told people that I couldn't be him spiritually. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't a physical thing. You know, only a sensitive person can pick up on this, but this guy had a friggin' glow about mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm serious. I mean, he had yeah. a little haze around him that you could feel. You know, really? and spiritually, I couldn't beat him. No, yeah. look at him. Have you ever seen him swear? No. Have you ever no, seen the guy get less. upset? Right. I've never seen him get upset once. Me neither. Never. You know, he's, uh, now that's uh, Mr. Olympia, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and Dorian's I've never seen swear either. Right. And Dorian did good things, you know? Mm-hmm. I just think we're, it's over. Hmm. Uh, I really think it's over. And I hope Classic Physique, this new champion, he goes on to do great things, and they just get rid of Pro Bodybuilding over the next couple of years. Well, I predict it. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you said that, you said that a couple of years ago. Well, I, are they going to show this on CBS? They're going to show the Mr. Olympia? Let me tell you something. That two years, a few years ago, when they did the Mr. Olympia by itself, and it was the last time Kai Green competed in the Olympia, dude, I went to the prejudge, and there wasn't even 500 people in the audience. And then hmm. at the night show, there was lucky to have 1,000. Hmm. That thing could not be done by itself to draw fans. Yeah. It happened the year after, too. Kai was gone. They did it again. Nothing. So the, hmm. why do you think they have to put the Mr. Olympia with this big, huge trade show? And, you know, you've got, these, you've got followers of these freaks that are just young guys that just don't know any better. Mm-hmm. That follow these, you know, freak shows. And, but they had to put the Mr. Olympia with a bunch of other shows to get people in there. And right. let me tell you, I knew this was going downhill three years ago. I went to the Mr. West Palm Beach. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting in the pre-judging. And, oh, my God, it was long because now we have bikini and figure and women's physique at that time. And so, you know, the, the pre-judging lasted a very long time. Started at 8, got over like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. So as soon as the pre-judging was over, the bodybuilding was last. And, yeah, I'm telling you, there's probably 100 people left in the audience of like 3,000 by the time bodybuilding come on. Yeah. And then in there, that, wow, this is shifting big. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then, uh, then I stopped going because the promoter wanted to make me pay. Yeah. Make me pay in Florida. How I many people are put in shows? Mm-hmm. Go to the sport. I'm an icon. I don't care what anybody says. Right. I'd be a legend for nothing. I worked hard for that. Nobody gave me that. Mm-hmm. I, I worked for it. I mean, I'm very proud they called me that, but I worked for it. Remember some of the shows in the 80s, how, how loud the crowd was? Oh, 80s was great time. Yeah. I'm amateur yeah, bodybuilding and pro bodybuilding. And can you believe I don't even follow the sport anymore? I never yeah. thought in a million years that I would be doing this now, not following the sport, not picking mm-hmm. up the mags no more, because the mags are all advertisements on crap, yeah, most products, of anyway. all this garbage. And flex is not even very that hardcore anymore. No, They've turned into just a whole bunch of advertisements. Right. I mean, muscle mag was, uh, my, my favorite was muscle, muscle mag, but then, you know, then uh, Robert Kennedy died, and mm-hmm. they're, they're trying to, they're, they're emulating the same other magazine. Yeah. You know, every other page is an advertisement for products or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, Flex was not like that when, in my era, and Muscle Mag was so awesome in our era. Yeah. I mean, that was hardcore. And, yeah, and well, they, that was, was one big of my sellers. favorites. So. Yeah. Let's talk 1990. about that 1990 Olympia. What what did you what were your feelings when you heard that they were going to uh, drug test the contest? Well, my first thing was like, oh my god, why are they doing this? Mm-hmm. Because you know this was never going to get into the Olympics. It was la- Ben and Joey's last hurrah. Yeah, try to get it into the Olympics, which does the, the Olympics wasn't the IOC was not interested in bodybuilding. He knew all about the drug abuse in it, so that was never going to happen. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just knew me because they were so tough on me that mm-hmm. I, I, was, I wasn't going to take drugs. You know, I was going to suck it up and train like they did. But like I said, I had to do two hours of cardio a day to get in shape. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and it is what it is. But, I, you know, How long did you have that show? Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? 14 weeks. Yeah. And low carbs. All to because, you know, the drugs work phenomenally. To burn fat, and you know, 
Uh, yeah. Especially when you take ster- when you took steroids, you got to take Cytomel because uh-huh. um, steroids sold on this T3, which is fat mobilization. It stops, so you got to take a little bit of Cytomel, which I took a low dose anytime I took steroids, and then mm-hmm. it go right off after the show, and I, my thyroid was never hurt. You mm-hmm. know, but um, you know, I still had a follow protocol, so I started dieting 14 weeks out. Right. I mean, I had to. I didn't have a choice. Still, when you would normally you know, do a show, how long would you take the steroids before a show? Like three what, three months or something? I would start uh, usually uh, 14 weeks out. I do a six-week cycle of water-holding drugs. I usually duck out, test, and um, antibar, and maybe I'm back in the That was it. And then six, take a two-week break, let my receptor sites open back up. And then six weeks before the show is all fast. I can test propionate. Uh, primo mm-hmm. and acetate, both um, Primo Depot, Primo Acetate, and Primo Pills, because that's the only drug you eat, no calories on, and get better. Um, right. Obviously, uh, I did um, Masterone at the time, it was available. I um, mean, uh-huh. Hallow Testin, which made me crazy, but made you hot as a rock. Uh-huh. Hallow Testin, Anavar, you know, I think I'm forgetting, it. went through V, injectable. Yeah. And that was my six drugs and my. Two orals, Cytomel and Halitestin. No, I'm sorry, three orals. You know, Halitestin, Anavar, and Cytomel. So you would take but, that, um, all that like 14 weeks out before the show? No, that was six weeks out. When I, we were talking oh, about weeks. the first six weeks was a kind of a gross spread thing. Taking okay. drugs that really held a lot of water. Like I said, DECA test, Dianabol, and uh, usually I love Dianabol, you know, it was a great drug. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was what I did for them. My first cycle is just so I could train heavy and get enough synovial fluid production in my joints so I could train heavy as I always did, you know? Right, right. I never, I never had started having joint problems so, well, just last few years. I mean, everything's so, broken down, but it's to be expected. I train like a fucking animal. So when you well, did it natural, Mike, and you were, you were dieting like 14 weeks and you had to go cardio twice a day and shit and you weren't doing any drugs at all, uh, what was your body weight compared to, like, like a normal contest? Well, you look at 88, I come to the night show 209, but with such a different look from the drugs. Mm-hmm. Hot as nails. Now, I show up to the Mr. Anthony Natural, I'm 200 pounds and soft with no legs. Okay. Now, you can see a huge difference if you take a picture of me then and then take a picture of me at that show. You mm-hmm. see the difference of what drugs would do to somebody. You know, especially somebody like me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a great metabolism, but that's why I was so big. Right. All drugs. Yeah, bro, I was so naturally strong. Right. What it did for me was make me get cut. I never lost any strength. So your strength had to go down too, right, Mike, when you were getting ready for this? Doing all that cardio well, and low carb? My, obviously, I dropped my poundages because I was always afraid not dropping that much. Yeah. Because I was doing supersets and stuff by then, trying to, speed on my metabolic rate. Right. But, you know, I was careful of poundages because I didn't want to tear something. And yeah. I was always walking a fine line of ripping something off the bone. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, by the time you're two weeks out, you're, you're just going to the gym and getting a workout in because you're brain damaged. Yeah. You know, don't forget, I did low carbs for shows. Right. You know, I had a bowl of oatmeal every morning for carbs. Mm-hmm. That was there, it. Three days, yeah. three days, oh, just protein and vegetables. Three days low, and one day eat back up about 400 grams of carbs, uh-huh. and that will be all. That'll be all gone the next day training, and by the next day after that, I'm back to suffering. Right, but, right. You know, it's what worked. You know, yeah. Guys, these guys couldn't do that. Yeah, I remember seeing a video of you. I think you were training with uh, Neil Spruce at the at the Gold oh, yeah. in Venice, and it was right before that 90 Olympia. And you look good. I mean, you were smaller, yeah. but you you still no, look good. See how good I looked. Then, but you know, mm-hmm. a month later was the show, and um, you know, I had still more to get rid of. You know, yeah. You know, you got to go by the mirror. If you got fat in your lower back or your glutes, you're fat. Yeah. You're not ready. So at that point, yeah, I'm looking really good, but that's four weeks out. Yeah. And then you know, you know getting down to the fine tuning. Plus, mm-hmm. obviously, I overtrained because I was a nervous wreck. Yeah. You know, I'm about to show the world what I look like naturally. Yeah, and, you know, and, and all your past showings, you're looking, you know, pretty amazing, and then you have to show up looking like that. Yeah. You know, it wasn't a great, it wasn't a great feeling. I think off of my pulse routine, that made me feel great. 
What did you think the other competitors were going to do? Do you think did you think they were all going to play by the rules and all go natural like you did? Yeah. Well, I can tell you, Lee Haney did. And Lee Labrada did. Mm-hmm. Remember, Lee Labrada almost beat Lee Haney, which I have yeah. no idea how they even think that. Yeah. Listen, you can't turn around with Lee Haney and not have a back and beat him. Right. Come on, Lee Labrada had no back at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I forget the other five places, but. You know, um, I, I was Ray, 10th, and Eddie Robinson was 11th. Eddie was natural. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody that passed the test was natural. Because mm-hmm. there was no way of getting around it. Yeah. Okay, you got to remember, the thing with having body fat is metabolites of the mm-hmm. drugs you had taken in the past. That's why decadaravalin can just drop in your system 18 months after you've been off of it. Because right. molecules of the actual sure. drug, you know, Attract, attack themselves to fat cells. Yeah. Occasionally, I mean, occasionally, you know, it, it just pops in your system. Right, and, right. And, you know, it showed you on DECA. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, I remember when Arnold drug tested uh, his show. Right. I think that was the beginning of the year. It was, yeah, and, 1990 you know, I'm at the, Yeah, I'm at the uh, uh, banquet after. And, of course, I'm, uh, I'm just, a, I don't give a shit about nothing. Arnold comes up behind me at the banquet. I didn't see him. I'm sitting with a bunch of guys from New York. So, you know, pretty badass guys, you know. Serious mm-hmm. street bodybuilders that fight. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, I feel this tap on my shoulder, and I look up behind me, and there's Arnold standing with, a, like, a group of people behind him following him, like a fucking, you know, the pipe pipe. Mm-hmm. So, he's, you know, he said in his voice, Mike, why didn't you go on my show? And I looked straight up at him, and I said, because you... Like an asshole, drug tested the show, and I took Dr. Durabla last year and would have failed. And I went mm-hmm. back to eating. All the guys sitting at the table said his face went, went like sideways. Really? I couldn't believe I said that to him. And uh-huh. I don't care who he is. I told the truth. I couldn't compete because I was, I'd taken Dr. for eight months before that. Right. There was no way. I wasn't taking the risk of failing and being destroyed. Listen, Sean Ray won the fucking Arnold. Right. And then, you know, they should drug test. They did drug test him, but the results didn't come in for a month later. Right, right. And then he, they took the title from a man, the money. And then, mm-hmm. and, 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 um, Mike, Mike actually won the it. show. Yeah. And Michael won the show. Michael will come in at 185 pounds, but not look like 185 pounds. Yeah. You know, Mike's another guy that's a really religious guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's very religious and uh, great bodybuilder. I mean, give him yeah, got to give him to him natural. And then you had John Paul Guillaume, mm-hmm. who um, he was natural. He was amazing too. Yeah, but then you got to consider they're both black. I mean, yeah. black people compared to white people have much better natural God-given genetics. Right. And I'm not saying this is a racial slur, but it's no. a known fact. Yeah, the best athletes in the world by far are black athletes. Mm-hmm. And they've pretty much taken over most of every sport there is except hockey. You know, right. but we do have three pro hockey players that are black that are unreal. Mm-hmm. You know, so it is what it is, you know. And yeah. now in contemporary times, it's, they all they want to talk about is drugs. When you go online, do you ever see anybody posting about training hard or saying what they did? Or not much. You don't see much about hard the workout. No. They're not there no more. No. You know, they're really not. See a lot of younger guys going like real heavy, but it's almost like they're showing off, you know, just for YouTube or for their videos, you know. Come on, I don't care how you go. Show me some balls. Yeah. Show me. Let me see blood, sweat, and tears, because that's what right. it's about. Right. Okay. It's so easy to do a set and then wait five, six minutes and then do another set. Dude, I, it may be, it would make me crazy. I can't mm-hmm. wait to do the next set. You know, yeah. I'm on fire. I'm, I'm, just, right. you know, I'm, I'm an athlete. I'm not a yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah. You know, that's what people used to say to me. Mike, you're not just a bodybuilder, you're an athlete. And they were right. That's what Dorian said when I interviewed him recently. He said, you know, how you don't really see much anymore about the heart training, you know, because you don't see anybody oh, coming no. up with different well, kinds of training or harder training, you know. Well, Dorian was the last hurrah. And, you know, the interview with Joe Rogan was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, Dorian was very truthful. And, you know, people got upset with it. And I remember going on a post saying, what are you guys talking about? You all train like pussies. I mean, mm-hmm. and they just don't know what to say to me. Yeah. You know, because I'm from an era right before Dorian that were hardcore. Yeah. You know, I mean, even Lee Haney tr- didn't train as heavy as me. 
But he trained fast. You know, he trained he hard. 10 to 12 reps per set nonstop. Mm -hmm. Him and Rope Man would go back and forth, just like I would go back and forth with my training partner. You had enough time to breathe while your training partner was finishing the set, even though you're still nauseous and about to throw up. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just trying to make it to the end of the workout. Yeah. I mean, that was always my philosophy. You know, I have sets of numbers in my head, but in the exercise, I always did my workout the night before while I was sleeping. You know, before I go to bed, I think about my workout, yeah. visualize what I was going to do the next day, and I'd do it. Mm -hmm. Identically to what was in my mind, exercise reps, but just, you know, using heavy weight to failure. You know, I'm talking about doing 400 pound cable rows for 15 reps, not putting it down at eight. Yeah. You know, I'm talking about doing heavy poundages with forced reps, you know, right, pull downs right. with 400 pounds for, you know, five on my own and then five forced reps with my trainer partner. Yeah. You know, I mean, you you can't even hold yourself down barely because you know, I'm not 400, I don't weigh 400 pounds. Right, right, right. But come on, you still push downs with 300 pounds. My training partner would have to hang on my traps <laughs> so I wouldn't get pulled off the ground. I mean, yeah. I did skull crushes with 315, you know. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to hold my legs so I wouldn't flip over backwards from the weight. Yeah. You know, close grip benches, 455 for reps. I mean, I did this my, uh, my whole life. Yeah, yeah. I just wish I knew about going light and heavy, which I got educated on late, later by the late, you know, Dr. Fred Hatfield, who taught me mm -hmm. about fiber specific training, because mm -hmm. I could have stayed longer and been healthier. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everybody wanted to see me train heavy, so every seminar all over the world, part of my seminar was watching me do a workout. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, I set up before I got there with one of the gym owners, uh, give me the most hardcore guy you got. I don't know. It is what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. When you were at that 90 Olympia and you, you said uh, you came out, you knew, you knew from the prejudging that you weren't going to be up there, right? Because you thought that you were, oh, your legs course, without lost you listen, They never called me out, okay? Mm -hmm. In the 88 Olympia, I didn't get called out to the seventh or eighth thing because when me standing relaxed, I look okay. But when I pose, my body explodes. Right? Right. I have what they call the mushroom effect. You know, mm -hmm. I just blow up. Yeah. And, you know, as soon as I got called on the eighth call and then I just... You know, you're probably looking at 10 through 10, 9, 8 places right there. And uh -huh. then you see me in 8th, and then I'm getting pulled out against Stridham and whoever was 5th, and then I just moved right up. Mm -hmm. And then I was in on placing. But, you know, I got screwed. I should have been top 3 or 2nd. Mm. You know, I wasn't 6th. I, wasn't I mean, what's the video? What's the prejudging? I mean, it's, like I said, they don't, they're not comparing me. Let me tell you something. This is a great story. 88, I was having a phenomenal year. Okay. Okay. I was on the rise, and I went to the first Grand Prix. It was England. And, you know, Lee Haney always would go to the first Grand Prix. Right. right. From the Olympia. And that would be last. So, you know, he won the English Grand Prix. But, you know, they pulled him up once and put him in line. Now, all of a sudden, I'm getting called out in the first call-outs. Hmm. Me against Barry, Richie, and, and, uh, and Labrada. Yeah. That's never happened before, okay? The English people loved me. The English judges loved my physique. You know, I was hardcore. So yeah, that's why you, um, you won the Navi Universe over in London too, right? In England. Yeah, in 84. Yeah. But honestly, I'm so proud of that title. I, I won the Miss Universe at all the great legends in the sport of one. Right. You know, never. Unfortunately, when I won it, I came home and they wouldn't let me turn pro. I've mm -hmm. been screwed so many times, but, you know, I never gave up. Yeah. All I did was piss me off. Oh, really? You're not going to be turn pro? Okay, I'll win here then. Right. And, you know, it didn't take me until 1987 turn pro. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was just, I don't know. It's just, uh, it just became bullshit to me. You know, come on. You know, you always know by call outs. And this is the, gets the kicker, right? Now, I'm watching the judging panel. My trainer partner's backstage watching the judging panel. So the next judge, I'm about to be called out for the third straight time, which has never happened. The next judge says, okay, lip reading now. Says, you know, Judge says, Quinn, Gasparri, and Demay. And um, mm -hmm. we watched Wayne DeMille, we read lips, say, him say, not Quinn. He really? was never pulled out again. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can tell you, Wayne DeMille is a piece of shit. What did he have against you? You know, he fucked over Barty forever. How many years he did the Night of the Champions for 25,000 grand prize? Mm -hmm. You know how much money he made over the years? I mean, you you're talking millions. Mm -hmm. The Night of the Champions, the prejudging would sell out. The Night Show would sell out. Yeah. 
I mean, and he had that going on since 1978. Mm-hmm. My first show I ever seen was Rob and Danny Pedro battling for uh, Night of the Champions, 1978. Right. My first pro show I ever went to. Right, right, and my right. friends took a train in New York, you know, and we went and seen the show. And what a show that was! God, did yeah. that motivate me? Yeah. And Robbie was my idol. Mm-hmm. You know. Pedro good too, Queen. Way, right? Oh my God! And then um. My friends always just say, Quinny, you're gonna be you're gonna be one of these guys. You yeah. know, I wouldn't think much about it. I just I knew I had the next workout the next day and I'm you know, I'm like, you know, nineteen and mm-hmm. you know, I'm just starting. So, you know, you don't think too much about that. It's your right. goal in your mind. Right, right. You don't go around acting like that or saying anything like that. Yeah. You know, you, you gotta walk the walk, man. I took what I wanted. Nobody gave yeah. me shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I was lucky I was friends with Jim Manion. They didn't have to let me win the USA. Mm-hmm. It was a big show. It was yeah. the people in my show. Yeah. And listen, the top five heavyweights all became pros. Yeah. Johnny Moran. I mean, my, that, that division was loaded. Aaron Baker. Right. And one, and listen, and one guy, I don't know why, who, they have fucked so much more than me was Aaron Baker. Mm-hmm. You know, that kid had the most phenomenal seek, one of the most phenomenal physiques I've ever seen. Yeah. And I did. constantly watched him not win a place, and I was like, what is the stigma with this, you know? And they were saying he was in the, uh, to, uh, in the oh, WBF. They were saying he was his, because his mannerisms, he was very uh, effeminate, you know? Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Like, he was just a nice guy, but, you know, they would say, like, borderline gay. He was never gay, mm-hmm. you know? But that's, they said he, he presented it in that way, you know, when he posed the talk, and, uh, you know, it's just, all it takes is one powerful person not to like you yeah and uh oh the weed just hated me after my first cover of iron man i what? told truth about taking steroids it was oh. over mm-hmm. it was all over after that brother but they couldn't stop putting me on covers of magazines and they couldn't stop the promoters from begging me to go on the shows so right. the ticket sales would go up when they put my name on the venue mm-hmm. they, they they even told me you would go up every time i went on a cover of a magazine only person that beat me on um, marketing when they follow how sales were in was Arnold. And Arnold would beat me like, like one point. Mm. So I was a top seller. I made millions for them by myself. Yeah. I remember when I'm on a cover of Muscle Fitness in America, there are 10 or 12 other muscle and fitnesses in other countries that have taken the picture, taken a picture from that photo session and made it a cover. And you know how many covers I don't have? Mm-hmm. I mean, I have 50 myself, but I've been on, I think, 104 covers. That's uh, great, I've yeah. been the fourth most publicized bodybuilder in the history of the sport. Well, I remember when you used to do interviews, you were really so honest, and that's why uh, you were so popular. Yeah, well, I paid a price for that. But you know one the thing about telling the truth, dude? I can say to you something today, and five years from now, you ask me the same question, you'll get the same answer. Mm-hmm. You don't get anywhere lying. You know, we had to say that he didn't take steroids Mm -hmm. because that's the person who he is you know he's a family man on a gym you know Mm -hmm. know, a very good christian you know he's a he's a um deacon or whatever he is i mean that that followed his persona he didn't he he didn't need to talk about taking steroids but Mm -hmm. then you have somebody like me who's like the all-time bad boy of the history of the sport which i didn't want that accolade but got it um, and you had me who just always told the truth, you know, didn't take shit from people, got major fights all, everywhere I went, yeah. you know, because I just was not going to take shit from people. And people always thought bodybuilders can't fight. Well, guess what? I know how to mm-hmm. fight. And I've been fighting my whole amateur career working in nightclubs in Boston. And I've seen bloodbaths. I'm lucky I'm alive. I didn't get killed. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen people die in front of me, you know? Wow. I mean, working in the clubs down in you know, Boston, I mean, Working in one club that was in Faneuil Square that was the most dangerous club in the state at that time. Called the Rat Stellar. Where was that at? Uh, the name of the club was called the Rat Stellar in Kenmore Square. Okay. Wow. All the all the security guys were professional boxers. Wow. And then <laughs> later on they did a mob thing about it. You know, a couple of guys that I worked with were um stone cone killers for the mob. Mm-hmm. You know, and did hits. So I I've been in the mix. Yeah. You know, don't forget, I lost my gym to the mob. I didn't know they were my partner. Right. I remember that. I lost a million dollars in one signature. So, 
you gotta do what you gotta do when you have a family, you know. Yeah. Hey, before I let you go, let's talk a little bit about the WBF because uh, you got involved with that, and that lasted two years, and they also did some drug testing there. Barry Stratton was not drug tested. Uh-huh. We all feel the same about that. He said he was natural. Get the fuck out of here. Right. You're not natural. What? Naturally what? Being, <laughs> he wasn't getting tested, dude. Right. There's no way. We all look bad. Yeah. Except for him. Both years. And I'm the one that got the WBF together. Vince McMahon approached me and a human Boca because he had a massive mansion here on A1A on the ocean. And he trained in my gym. So, you know, of course he knows about me, you know, everybody knew about me at Fall Bodybuilding. And, um, you know, we're in the gym one day, he says, you know, Mike, what do you think about me doing my own federation? I said, you got to pass. I said, they, we just paid us nothing. You know, I got $32,000 for two years, mm-hmm. 32 a year. That didn't even pay my rent, you know, we're in L.A., barely. And I just said, yeah, Ben, you got to pay us. So, you know, I did it for the money. Mm-hmm. Come on, I, I got a four hundred thousand dollar contract for two years. Wow. You know what it was like getting a, a check for twenty thousand a month? I didn't care about doing exhibitions. Yeah. But yeah. he was the hot he was the hottest on me because I was a bad boy and he thought he was gonna straighten me out. Like he would straighten out the wrestlers. So there was a few wrestlers that he never could straighten out that would tell him to go fuck himself. That was Hawk, mm-hmm. the Legion of Doom, you know, the Road Warriors. Hawk told him to fuck off. Hulk Hogan would tell him what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, those are a couple of guys that Vince could never tell what to do. But I remember when he fired me, um, I, don't know, I probably had a couple months left on my contract, and he said, oh, Mike, you're a real man's man. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? I was like, why would somebody say that to another guy? Well, mm-hmm. come to find out, I think he, you know, I'm not going to say it, but he, swing, he likes both genders. <laughs> you know, and that's that's been going on for a while. Mm-hmm. Nobody says what it is, but it's there. Mm-hmm. You know that he. Um, I guess he likes guys, but you know that's always been a rumor. Mm-hmm. That has come from multiple people that are in um, wrestling that I got to be friends with. You understand mm-hmm. the, the wrestlers hated the WBF bad, except for me. Okay, because we were getting paid. You understand? Mm-hmm. Vince was killing these guys and paying them by the night. There's no contracts. These guys were risking their lives. If they got hurt, they weren't making money. Mm-hmm. You know, so they hated the WBF. They didn't hate me because I hung around with Hawk, an animal, and lived up in Minneapolis where a lot of the, you know, the guys were. And I'd go out with them and get in fights. Me by myself. I would, you know, somebody be fucking looking at me wrong or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, staring, and I read lips and look at this steroid head. As soon as somebody would call me a steroid head or anything, I'd explode. Before the WBF or, or while it was going on? Oh, during. During. Uh-huh. Yeah, I moved to Minneapolis uh, my first year. Uh-huh. The first year I went from Palm Beach to Minneapolis because I moved there with my fiance Dana Golden. And, of course, I fucked that up, you know. I was, you know, with the ADHD, you have very little impulse control. Uh-huh. So I'm the type, if, you know, if something's going to go on, I'm going to be the one to go first. Uh-huh. You know, it's always there. Get Mikey to do it. He'll do it, you know? We right. had an old commercial when we were kids. Uh-huh. Get Mikey to eat it, you know? But that was right. identical to my personality. And mm-hmm. especially when someone was about to come violent, when somebody was, you know, a predator or, or a bully, and I, for some reason, I'd always walk up on it, and uh, I'd always just kill the fucking person trying to beat people up. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, was my calling, man. Nobody else was doing it. And, uh... You know, because I got bullied as a kid. Right. You know, I was the youngest in my neighborhood, the smallest. I got fucking beat up every day. So mm-hmm. then I grew up, so I'd take Taekwondo with Billy Blanks, and he's teaching me how to kill people, you know, on the street, using Taekwondo for street fighting, which is deadly. And uh, I started training and getting stronger and stronger. I mean, I understand, I was bipolar. But when you got upset, like and lost your temper, my adrenaline mm-hmm. would go so to the roof. And I would get so strong that I could pick somebody up and throw them across a room. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're talking brute, like gorilla-like strength. Right. You know, right. Just when I'm seeing red, you know, it's, you know I don't remember. Mm-hmm. And people can hit me. and I mean, I've been hit so many times while fighting and never feel a thing. I wake mm-hmm. up in the morning with stitches and bruises, you know. 
Yeah. But, you know, you don't feel nothing. I mean, you see a 140-pound guy that's bipolar and in a mental institution, and it takes four fucking wards, you know, four guys to hold them down. Mm-hmm. It's just so uncontrollable because the strength you get when you have a, a bipolar moment. Yeah. It's actually between, it's, it's actually called bipolar manic depression. I don't take medication for that because it's too strong. But mm-hmm. I take two medications for ADA, ADHD and um, depression. Yeah. That I function well on and uh, obviously haven't gone bipolar in a while because I haven't put me in a situation that I needed to. Except when I broke my hand ruptured my elbow nerve, somebody went after my mother and oh, really? I hit the guy so hard on his forehead, my arm exploded. You know, I should have I should have aimed it down towards the nose, but the guy was in the six feet tall and you know, basically told my mother to fuck off and he didn't even know I was around. Hmm. And I came up, I tapped him on the shoulder and I said, What the fuck do you say? Blam. I hit him this so far. This is this is how you hurt your arm? It was when I hurt my arm. My arm was a year and eighteen months ago. Wow. I told you I just got released to start training and it was right. that long of a healing time. Yeah. But I hit this guy so hard, man. It's hard to knock somebody out when they hit him in the forehead, but he was down and out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the amount of velocity, I'm, I'm literally running two steps before I hit him. Yeah. And I'm throwing, you know, I'm throwing my back into it and, you know, my arms, my shoulders, and I'm, I'm rotating my hip because I know I'm mm-hmm. going to punch. I learned how to throw proper punches from Vinny Pazienza when I was his quarterman. Yeah. So I learned how to basically on-the-job training for fighting right. when I was a kid. <laughs> right. You know, it, it was. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've, and I've saved a lot of people from getting really badly hurt or killed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, but that's the environment I was growing up in. I yeah. in Boston, and it's one of the worst places in the country. Yeah, the smaller yeah. New York, but the same amount of crime and violence, and yeah. you, know, you get stuck in the wrong neighborhood. You know, you 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 can't even stop at red lights because you're either getting shot at or bricks thrown at your car. Mm-hmm. And there's places in Boston like Roxbury is all black, and you're white. You get caught in that neighborhood, they'll kill you. Yeah. And then there's Charlestown, which is the most unsolved murders in the world per really? capita, and that's where Whitey Bulger was from. Right. And, he was sending, you know, arms to the IRA mm-hmm. in Ireland to fight. They have the most unsolved murders per capita. It's only four city blocks big. That's how small the town is. Wow. But have like 75 unsolved murders and they will never be solved. Right. And, uh, yeah, the IRA is, is here, you know. Mm-hmm. They're here in America. Yeah. I mean, just like what's going on. But, you know, it, it, was, it is what it is. I didn't have a choice but to fight, mm-hmm. you know, unless I wanted to get beat up. Yeah. But, you know, my symptoms of ADHD and bipolar got so strong when I, you know, I, I took steroids. My my symptoms were manifold 10 times. That's why mm-hmm. I didn't like being on steroids all the time. I yeah. felt uncontrollable in my temper. So you were bipolar when you were competing. You just didn't know it. When I was competing, brother, and I was on drugs. I wouldn't go into public very often, just to the gym twice a day. And, right. you know, I was at a girlfriend at that time that would help me. Right. You know, I'd be so low on carbs a month out that I couldn't drive to the gym. Yeah. Uh, I'd eat my bowl of oatmeal and my protein, and off to the gym I went to meet Robbie to do my first workout, and that'd be it. I'd still yeah. come back at nighttime, but the carbs are all gone into my system. Mm-hmm. It's just pure discipline and pure passion. Right. Like you're not, you way. know, you're feeling terrible, but you, you know, you're pushing through it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what an athlete does. Yeah. That's what a professional athlete does. Okay. Mm-hmm. They, they walk through fear and especially walk through pain. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, my life was painful. Yeah. It wasn't a walk in a park, especially training. Mm-hmm. I killed myself. Yeah. You know, that's to be expected. I got things going on now, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, Mother, I wouldn't change a thing. Really? Yeah. My life. Maybe that I just would have had light days, but yeah, that was going to happen. That was going to happen. Right. My personality right. back then. Yeah, I think probably would. You know? Somebody would have told you to do that back then. You probably wouldn't have done it anyways, right? Yeah, you couldn't. You know, like I said, I had that mind of an athlete, and I can yeah. have light workouts. You know, I'm paying for it now, but come on, I- I'm happy. Yeah, I hear you. Hey, I, I don't cry. I feel sorry for myself. Right. The only people are so worse off than me. 
that's why if you look on my Facebook, I always share tragedies, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't share bodybuilding stuff. Yeah. You know, I share things about our troops, about our police, about animals. I mean, right. you know, a child that has cancer and just wants, you know, people to know and get some shares, you know. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. people contact them. That's what I do. Right. Okay, that's what's important to me because, you know, you got to really remember what I say. Don't feel sorry for yourself because somebody, so, somebody else is always so much off. And oh, yeah, for you. sure. For sure. Oh, and she's always been right. And uh, anytime I get in that I feel sorry for myself, Ad, dude. It snaps me right out. Yeah, so yeah. If I have a bad day, all I can do is go on Facebook and see how good I have it. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. But, you know, that's the life I chose, and I'm proud I did. Yeah. Uh, well, you had a great yeah. career, Mike. So uh, I know a lot of us uh, looked up looked up to you and uh, enjoyed watching you when you were uh, in your prime. You know, and you had a great, uh, a lot of great appearances in your shows. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dude, you know how much I spent a thousand dollars on my music. Any what? Every year. And then go into a polling room like with like Rick Valente. Yeah. And it, it would take I'd have to start posting about six weeks out when I got the music. Uh -huh. I'd get the music and I'd put it in my car and, and listen to it constantly over and over again and start visualizing in my mind. Yeah. 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 Send a beat, I would hit that post or that post to. It wasn't easy. You gotta remember my posing routines. If I miss one beat, oh, yeah, oh. right, right. I remember, that, but I'd know it. Mm -hmm. oh, it. It was always time to the point. Yeah. Listen, I worked very hard on posing. Yeah, and it showed. Yeah, you know, Lee Haney was a decent poser. You know. Yeah. And uh, and we also have what's the same more love as Francis Mentado. Yeah. Oh my God, what a beautiful physique, and he still looks great. Have you seen him? Yeah, yeah, he does. He looks amazing. All my damage, like my shoulders and my neck, they're all from fighting, blunt force trauma, and yeah. car accidents. Yeah. No, none of my stuff is, um, I mean, my joints from wearing tear, that's because of my age, but, you know, I am working with other companies. They're coming out with these new things that actually can rehabilitate your whole system. Mm -hmm. You know, they are coming out with some cutting end stuff. Like today, I was studying about, you know, I'm a type 2 diabetic now. Are you? When I hurt my back, I was bedridden for three years. I went up to 290 pounds fat. Holy cow. So, you know, after I lost the weight and then had some blood work done, well, my doctor said, you got diabetes. I was like, no way. Wow. So, you know, I've been on medication now for, I don't know, four years, I think. Uh -huh. But, you know, today I, I found something that they're, they're curing diabetes with this food that they're getting, spices they're getting from, like, Sri Lanka. Really? You know, huh. there's, there's a study, and I just, you know, I just sent in the money to, it's only 375 to send in an actual dietary meal uh -huh. plan. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing people, uh, they're curing type 2 diabetes. Hmm. So, and one of the main ingredients is coconut oil. Hmm. You know, it has remarkable um, medical things that it does with your body. Remarkable. Yeah, right. And they've, they had, you know, they had um, 13,000 patients. Over 13,000 patients uh, did the survey and did the diet. Mm -hmm. Every one of them, every one of them didn't have type 2 diabetes anymore. Wow. Every okay. one of them. Right. Diabetes medication I'm on will eventually kill me. Yeah. You know? Even though I'm type 2 and I take pill, over the long range, it, it destroys your heart and everything else. That's yeah. why training and dieting is so important to me. That, that keeps me, um, helps my body a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Foods affect us. Yeah, for you sure. Know, if you eat like shit, you don't look like shit and act like shit. Yeah. You know, that's true. You are what you eat, brother. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you get better soon, Mike. Uh, I, you know, I love. I know how much you love to train, so I you know you'd like to get back Dude, into the gym and start there's, training again. There's no stopping me. No, I know. The day I give up is the day they're burying me. Right. You know, I'm just going to train to what my ability is now. Yeah. I've lost the use of two of my right fingers on my right hand because the surgery was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to use these, I got these special straps now that come from my wrist, and I just got to put my fingers over the top. Okay. Um, I've got the special straps, but I'll probably just be doing mostly really fast circuit training. I just yeah. want to get in shape. I don't want to yeah. be a big bodybuilder anymore, because I'll never take drugs like that. I'll take my hormone replacement therapy, eat yeah. right, and train, and train fast. It's yeah. over. Right. You know, you got to know when it's over, and these guys do. <laughs>
Right. I see these guys are making comebacks and they're in the fifties, and I'm like, "What are you stupid?" <laughs> I mean, you know, most it's easy to have a heart attack because and remember, steroids. Every steroid, except for testosterone, is cholesterol binding in the arteries. Mm-hmm. That means it clogs your arteries. Mm-hmm. In 2004, I woke up and I had trouble breathing. I went to the hospital and they did an EKG and immediately sent me up to the hospital. And three of my arteries were 90% closed. I was wow. in a heart attack or a stroke within days. And, you know, I'm smart enough. I go to all my doctor's appointments where you never see bodybuilders, especially this contemporary era. They don't go have blood work done constantly. They don't go to the doctor's appointments. They said I was crazy. But I was never stupid, you know. Yeah, I was right. crazy. yeah, but I was never stupid, man. I was on top of my body. I knew what they could do to me, and I wanted to know what was happening with my body when it happened. Yeah. You know, I had a full-blown heart attack in 2010 in my sleep. Didn't find out for a year later that I had the heart attack, but, you know, I just had a bunch of heart tests, and uh, I'm perfect. My stents are wide open. I don't have any problems, blood flow, yeah. nothing. I, I, they yeah. gave me a battery of tests, and I passed with flying colors. Uh-huh. So... Uh, that gave me, you know, that gave me hope. Yeah. And I don't know why more of these guys aren't doing it because we're seeing them die. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, heart, heart disease is killing them. So, listen, you cannot eat that much food, take insulin, and not have a heart problem. You know, you got kids and people dying all over the world that, you know, they don't make the newspapers or anything. Yeah. They just die. I mean, we're talking a lot of people. Yeah. And it's going to yeah. get worse before it gets better. Right. All right, Mike. Well, I want to thank you for joining us again for another uh, good interview. I appreciate your thoughts. And, uh, you know, like I said, we were talking about the 90 Olympia, so it was great to hear your thoughts on that and everything else you had to say. I hope uh, you get back in the gym and start training again. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, Mike. We'll talk to you soon. And uh, good luck with your book and uh, good luck with everything. Well, thank you very much. See you later. Bye. Okay. Take care, Mike. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Thanks again to Mike Quinn for coming on the show and doing the interview. Mike's birthday was last week. So happy birthday to Mike. And I want to thank our sponsors, Florida Alternative Medicine, Redcon One, and Old School Labs for sponsoring this season of the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. Thanksgiving is coming up this week, everybody. So have a great Thanksgiving. And we will see you guys next week when we interview Eddie Robinson. 1989 MPC USA winner, one of the most popular bodybuilders in the 1980s, and he was also a part of the 1990 Mr. Olympia. So we will talk to Eddie Robinson next week. Take care, everybody. 